So I want to talk to you for a minute about language. Because if I say the word rape to 10 people, 10 people are going to give me similar but different explanations. And we have to remember that when we're training people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they might know a word such as rape or sexual assault or sexual violence, but they might not really understand what that means. And that's really important to you as a trainer because if someone discloses to you that you've been raped, maybe what they're saying is one, they were raped and we need to take that very seriously. Maybe they're also telling you that something else happened to them, but they don't have the words to describe it. The only word they know is rape. And so we can't dismiss somebody just because they use a word that might not fit the definition as we know it. Another example is somebody might come up to you and say, do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? Are you married? Do you do it? Now, those questions are personal questions, and as a professional staff, you don't need to answer those questions, nor should you answer those questions. But on the other hand, the real important part is to ask, why is that person asking you the question? Maybe they're asking you not to find out anything about your personal life, but to find out whether you're a safe person to talk to about something that's happening to them. So a response might be, hmm, well, I really don't talk about my personal life because it's mine and it's personal. But I'm really curious why you asked that question. Is there something you'd like to talk about? You want to make sure that you let the person know that you are open to listening to them. At the same time, you don't have to answer any personal questions. We make an assumption that when we go in to do a training, that the people that we're training all have a basic understanding of healthy sexuality, and that means understanding boundaries and the importance of touch. The reality is that everybody's at a different place, and if we're trying to teach them about keeping themselves safe, what are we building it on? We have to remember that for people without disabilities, our boundaries are different sometimes than those for people with disabilities. That means I can put my hands up and say stop. I can move back to the side very easily. Someone who uses a wheelchair, someone who uses a walker doesn't have that instant mobility. Also, if I don't need help in dressing or toileting, then I don't really worry about what goes on when I close the bathroom door. But if somebody needs help with their personal hygiene and somebody needs to help them with that, um, even if it's just in dressing the person or helping them undress, then we talk about boundaries differently. And that really is an important factor when we think about keeping people safe, especially in terms of sexual violence. Another thing to consider is when somebody's telling you something, they might use a word different from what you're thinking they should use. So an example would be, we had a victim, a young woman who was in her early 20s. She was a victim of sexual assault. And what she described to law enforcement was that the man who raped her had a cold. And the defense, of course, argued, no, he didn't have a cold. He was perfectly healthy. And what happened was he had ejaculated on her leg, and there was cum. That was a word she didn't know. All she knew was, and I hope you're not eating right now, snot, because that's what it looked like to her. That's what it felt like to her. And she knew that because she'd had colds over her life, and she would need to blow her nose. So that's really important, even though she knew what had happened to her and she described it in a way that to her it made sense. If you just took it at face value, you'd say, well, she didn't know what she was talking about, and she did. Another example is when this young woman was interviewed by police, the police officer said to her, the person who did this to you, did he look like us? and they were Caucasian officers, and she said no. 
and then they said, okay, the person who did this to you, did they look like you? And she was African American, and she said no. And they said, well, there you have it. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Because we think in bipolar terms, we think in black and white, hot and cold. Her mother offered, um, her mother asked if she could ask the question, and the officer said yes. And she said, can you tell these officers who the person who did this to you looked like? And she said, yes. He looked like Mr. So-and-so, who was of Asian descent. This young woman knew exactly who had sexually assaulted her. But where you and I might say to the law enforcement, oh, no, this person was of Asian descent, she wouldn't do that. That's not an attribute for somebody with an intellectual disability. So she answered the questions truthfully, and yet if her mother hadn't been there, the whole course, the whole, and if her mother hadn't been there, the case would have ended there. It didn't, and the, court, the case did go to trial, and there was a conviction.